Hello, and welcome to Emmanuel Church Rio Rico's online virtual worship for February 25th, 2024. Let's pray. Lord Christ, we come before you today grateful for your love, grateful for your mercy, grateful for your goodness to us. And Lord, we lift up all who are in need of you, those who are suffering illness, Lord, those who are, um, who are stranded someplace, away from family and friends, those who have been injured and are suffering, those who are ill, those who are hospitalized, Lord, those who are in uh, perilous situations where their lives are endangered by warfare, uh, those who are endangered by crime, Lord, those whose, whose very livelihoods have been taken away from them so they do not know how to make a living anymore, Lord, all these and more that are on our hearts, we lift up to you. For only you truly know and understand and can do something about them. We pray, Lord, that you would use us to make a difference in people's lives. This we pray in your precious and holy name. Amen. Calling today's message, Dinner Lessons. This is happening in Luke chapter 14. And it's sort of an undisclosed time and date, but Jesus is at the home of a Pharisee eating dinner, and this is where he teaches these lessons. <clears throat> so, let's begin. First of all, love overrules. And yes, this is a little bit of a pun. could also be written as overrules one word, where love overrules other expectations. But let's take a look. This is from Luke chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, who was being carefully watched, there in front of him was a man suffering from abnormal swelling of his body. Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts in the law, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. So taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him on his way. Then he asked them, If one of you has a child or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull it out? And they had nothing to say. So understand now that Jesus has obviously been invited to the home of a Pharisee. And yes, there were prominent Pharisees who were interested in his message, who wanted to know more about what this man from Galilee was teaching and saying. Um, there were also some who were hoping to prove he was a fake, a phony. They, they felt like it was their duty to expose him if he was a fraud. Whatever the reason, and we are not given exactly what that reason is, although I think perhaps the, the second might be a little more possible. They're sitting at the table at dinner, <clears throat> and in front of them is a man with an abnormal swelling. In uh, the King James Version, it's called dropsy. Uh, so he has an obvious physical condition, something that is uh, doubtless unpleasant and probably painful to him and obvious to everybody that can see him. And so Jesus poses a question to the Pharisees and the experts in the law. And, and do understand where we would think of experts in the law as being somebody like lawyers or constitutional scholars. This is the law of Moses that they're talking about. So these are more what we might think of along the lines of a seminary professor or something like that. Somebody who has studied the Bible very extensively. So the Pharisees, who were supposed to be experts in the law, and these other experts in the law, who were apparently not Pharisees, because nothing would keep you from being a Pharisee if you were, a member, uh, if you were an expert in the law. And he asked them, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? Now, the Pharisees and most of the religious experts at the time said that since healing was work, and since you were not to work on the Sabbath, that it was against the law of Moses, the law of God, to heal on the Sabbath. Now, of course, they're thinking in terms of a doctor, 
uh, or a physician of some sort, something like that. But in this case, this is the miraculous act of God making this person whole. Not just removing the disease, but truly making them whole. Making them how they should be in the kingdom of God. Because that's what Jesus was doing. He was spreading the kingdom of God everywhere he went. And so he asked them, you know, is it all lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Or is it not lawful? And they didn't have a word to say. No comment. Uh, like an awful lot of people who know they're not right and they don't want to answer out loud because they don't make it obvious that they are wrong. And so he then poses another question to them. Uh, so if one of you has a child or, or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull it out? And they had nothing to say. Even more nothing than the first time, I'm sure. Um, if it was being written today, somebody might have written it. He asked them, and all he heard was crickets. Just silence. There's nothing coming from them. And, of course, the answer is, if your child or uh, your ox, which was a very important part of farm life, uh, fell into a well, of course you're not going to leave it there till the next day just because it's the Sabbath. And, in fact, there were allowances by almost all rabbis that said, in an emergency like that, you could act to take care of the emergency problem. Um, and Jesus, of course, knows this. He knows that's what they think, what they feel like. And so he uses this to explain why he healed on the Sabbath. Yes, he could have waited one more day to heal the man. It, he could have healed them the day after the Sabbath, Sunday, as easily as he could have on the Sabbath day. But the man was there, and the man needed help. Now, my mind is a little suspicious sometimes, and I can't help but wonder, did they put him there in order to test Jesus? It's quite possible. Uh, it happens in other places where they seek to test Jesus, but it's also just as possible that this man heard that Jesus was in the home of the Pharisee because word about Jesus spread quickly, and he was desperate, and he was willing to try anything to get better. So it may be that he had heard that Jesus was there and came to seek healing. In either case, the Pharisees really didn't have much they could say about it. They knew that doing good on the Sabbath was the right thing to do. Certainly better than not doing good on the Sabbath. But they would be revealing themselves as hypocrites if they admit it. Because they'd been so firmly and publicly against it for so long. Next, the host decides. Resuming in verse 7 of chapter 14. When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, for a person, person more distinguished than you may have come, may have been invited. So the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then, humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you'll be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Luke 14, 7-11. <clears throat> Jesus is, of course, a guest <clears throat> in the home of this Pharisee. And as such, he would have been, of course, treated as a, a special person. Even if the person was trying to catch him out, they still would have treated him like a guest. And so he was no doubt seated in the best position, uh, perhaps near the host or at the head of the table. 
what he sees, though, is that all these others are jockeying for position, all trying to get in the best place. And this is something with which we are quite familiar today. Uh, in fact, they've, they've even got a name uh, for, for people who do this thing, trying to get themselves in better positions than others. And um, in, in women, they're frequently being called a Karen, somebody who thinks that they deserve special honor, special treatment, somehow better than everybody else. And to any and all Karens out there, I apologize to you. It's not your fault. It's not based on you. It's just become a generic term, unfortunately. Um, but the idea of people trying to put themselves ahead of other people is very common. We are entering a, uh, a year of elections here in the United States. And heavens to Betsy, everybody is trying to prove how much better they are than everybody else. And I'm not picking out anybody in particular on this, but it's, it's something that we often find in social situations, too, where people rush to the head of the line because they think they deserve it, where people refuse to, uh, to be treated like other people and demand to be treated better. In the book Animal Farm by George Orwell, uh, there are certain rules that were written for the animals when they took over the farm, and one of them was all animals are equal. But by the end of the book, uh, the rules have been altered to where it said all animals are equal, some animals are more equal than others. In other words, some deserve better treatment. And sadly, this is one of the most human characteristics there is. It happens in all cultures. It happens among all people. It happens sometimes in families. It happens among friends. It happens in churches. And it should never happen. What Jesus says is, if you go to some place where there's better and worse places to be, go ahead and choose the worst place because it's quite possible the host, and I am certain he is talking about God when he's talking about the host here. The host will be the one to move you up, to give you honor. But if you try to claim the honor for yourself, the host will push you back and show that you do not deserve the honor. We can't all try to be what's now being called the GOAT, greatest of all time. Uh, we certainly try to be the best that we can be. We seek to do what is best in all times and all places. But it is not our place to decide that we deserve better or more than others. And that's what Jesus is telling us. Know our place. Let the host decide. We may think we are doing a great job at something, but the truth is we may not be. And we are not in the best positions to evaluate it. We must let God reward us as only he can see fit. Finally, consider your reasons. Then Jesus said to his host, when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back and so you'll be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. For many people, growth and progress means you get to associate and, well, let's just use the term, hang out with a better class of people, with richer people, with more powerful people, with more influential people. 
And you see, that's, that's sort of the opposite of how we need to be living. If we become successful and God grants us success, our time and our energy shouldn't be entertaining those who have something to give us back. We should be seeking to make sure that the, the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, those in need are taken care of. I don't know that Jesus literally meant that we have to give a banquet for them, but he may well have. And perhaps that's something that churches should start looking at. Hosting a banquet for those in need, inviting those who do not have resources otherwise. Now, I'm not saying that churches do not do that. Many churches do. Many churches are feeding homeless people on a weekly or even daily basis. Many churches operate food pantries to make sure that there's food and even clothing for people in need. Uh, many churches provide financial aid to those who need a, a place to, to live or who need to help pay a utility bill or, or all kinds of things. Our own church has done all of these things. And it was never with the thought of, what can we get out of this? So I know that there are many believers who do the same thing. But we need to be very careful that we don't think, well, more success means we get to be with better people. Because that's just not true. More success means we have more to give to help those who are desperately in need. And if we fail to do that, then we deserved to be moved down to the place of the least honor, like he was just talking about in the previous verses. Because we have done nothing to gain the respect and the love and the approval of the Lord God Almighty. Our lives must be lived in such a way that our repayment does not come now, but at the resurrection of the righteous. If we do this, we'll be living as true Christians, believers and followers of the Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, open our eyes to the needs of those around us. Give us grace Give us mercy. And Lord, when you bless us with material things, help us to keep in mind that we must use those blessings to help others. This we pray in your precious and holy name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Go in peace and may God bless you.